Hello, everyone. Oh, I changed that. Oh, I pasted by reference. Hello, everyone. What um, did you do? I uh, changed the title and it messed something up, but that's okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, today we are going to talk about the Ooh. creature book. We're going to have a stream. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, here we go. I'm going to open my Chrome and we're going to take a look at everything. Um, so, Cassie, yeah. creature book. Um, sorry, I'm uh, switching between windows. The Creature Book is a book that we are going to create where we make a thing, make a make a book that allows people to create creatures in their world. Yes. Um, and and that allows them to mix and match different parts of creatures, so that instead of uh, every world kind of having all the same monsters, like the Monster Manual, for example. Um, what happens instead is you can make your own little versions of everything and fit them in your world and, and potentially make it more unique and uh, make it more interesting for your players and, and for you, you know, create. Yeah. Um, maybe let's start with something we were talking about hmm. while, while the, while... Um, Things get rolling? Yeah, yeah. A little bit while we see who's going to join us and then um, we can get jumping into our, our main thing. Which creature? So, did you have any more ideas on the hydraulic armadillo? Oh my God. <laughs> Just a funny thing to call it uh, from the outset. Um, so uh, spiders in particular have uh, mm. muscles that allow them to pull their legs inwards, but then they have a hydraulic press essentially that propels them forward. So you have something like a jumping spider. Um, goodness. So I did mention to James earlier, why not play upon that and make a gully or canyon kangaroo that has a tail appendage that um yeah is basically like a hydraulic press and it can then jump long distances to escape yeah. uh prey uh predators or something yeah yeah so we were talking about how um what did you call it the the uh cat not cavern canyon. kangaroo canyon kangaroo um and what area would you imagine these living in so like around canyons but so think about the type of land that actual kangaroos live in. Okay, yeah, and that's, um, it's, in my opinion, usually pretty flat. But because there's what? there's types that are called like rock wallabies. Oh, okay. There's also actually a tree kangaroo. I don't. Uh, it's called a kangaroo. I don't know how much jumping it actually does. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I was looking through an animal encyclopedia and seeing that picture made me think. Oh, okay, maybe, maybe that's an option. Um. I guess the only issue I'm having with the hydraulic thing is trying to picture it as still a mammalian appendage instead of, say, a, basically, something like an arthropod. Um, oh, an exoskeleton yeah. kind of deal. Well, okay, what if, uh, what if you can imagine a mammalian animal that has an appendage that comes out and, like, similar to the way a chicken's legs do. Yeah. Where they're scaly. They're the one part of a chicken that's, like, scaly. Yeah. Hey, Josh. Josh is here. He says hello. Awesome. Um, Hi. So so what about that? Imagine that you have this, some creature, but this one part of them is sort of exoskeleton-y. Okay. Is that possible at all? Where it's just that one part is, like, allows them to propel, but isn't normal muscles? Yeah. Maybe, like keratin covered scales or something that gives it some extra rigidity because all that power from the hydraulics like i think it needs to be contained oh you know? yeah okay right what if yes what if it <laughs> what if similar to a snake's tail it um a, 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 a rattlesnake specifically because the way that oh, works is yeah. their keratin right yeah a rattlesnake i think rattle is keratin so it's bone and like so the same stuff that's like feathers and, and our, our nails not actually bone um yeah but things like that um so, where was I going with that? Keratin. I think because it grows. In oh, layers. yes. Okay, that's it. The, yeah, yeah. So, I was imagining that um, the, the rattlesnake, the sec segments grow, and then a new one grows under it, and that's how they get a longer tail. So, the longer, the older a rattlesnake is, the more it has, simply yeah. by way of molting, because the way it kind of builds more and more. Every time it sheds. Yeah, every yeah. time it sheds. Sorry. Sheds, yeah. Um, I say that because in the same way, if you had a tail that came out of something that had longer segments, if you think about the way that works is it's like kind of floppy, but if you, if you put tension on it, it's extremely yeah. hard, but keeps a, a, a strong arc. Yeah. So that kind of thing that, so almost a rattle coming out of another animal, a mammalian animal, 
that is their appendage that they can get that um, enough tension on and use their hydraulic limb. And then we need to see, like, oh, see. what kind of position is it going to be in. So right now I'm thinking of a spring tail, and this is almost like a little curly cue. It, if the head is here, it curls in and the tail is flipped up. Okay. And that is what goes down really sharply and then sends oh, it flying. Then, yeah, yeah. So we need to think then of that. Is it going to have this tail that actually, like, lays in on its belly? You know? Like, it, it can oh, yeah, it's yeah. usually tucked in as a part of its body. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah, I think it would um, have to be. Yeah. Interesting. But okay, yeah. so, uh, but that, that's an example. That. Yeah, so what we were doing there is taking a uh, hydraulic limb that, that usually um, are relegated to things like spiders. They have the muscle that can pull their, their legs in, maybe. Oh, they but shooting them out is only hydraulics. Correct. Like it's it takes only two one muscles. Direction. Yeah, it takes two muscles to the in out direction. Yeah. But the idea is a spider has one type one way and the other. So they can jump really far um, and do many other things really using it. But all that to say that, um, what were we saying? Um, we were talking about like the tail structure, I guess. Yeah. I think you're trying to go back a little yeah. bit further. Lisa, what was I? <laughs> Man. Oh, I was making a point and then I, I let myself. We did mention and... that it needs to be rigid. It has to be a rigid structure yep. to have the hydraulic thing. And it's singular direction. You know, it can't do a push and Oh, pull. you were saying it lays up against it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that yes. was it. Yeah, like, well, I was wondering what it kind of looked like. Oh, that's what I was saying. We were taking something, some sort of creature. In this case, we started with kangaroo, um, and we added this appendage to it to see what it would need. Like, how would that evolve in a way? And so that's what you mentioned is yeah. it would evolve. And I say how would it evolve, but really, like, why would they have it is a better way to put it. And why they have it is because it evolved that way. But the idea is that would allow them to jump over stuff like the canyons, like you mentioned. Yeah, I was actually starting to think a little structurally, and just bear with me, I think this is a little silly, but to have... So some animals have something called a penis bone. So what if it, it's, it was that, and over time, instead it's become the separate structure? Oh, okay, So it's yeah. actually a bone inside to be that muscle, that initial muscle to pull it up. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So. And then, a um, yes a biological way to make it i really like that like yeah. that's where it came from that is an explanation as to why it would happen <laughs> well what's interesting is that type of thing may not even be the sort of thing that makes it into the book yeah but because that has other implications that you know by us using that in our brainstorm you might come upon something later yeah that makes you realize why that was important I, you know, like, oh, we can use that concept now. and i that concept came up because i was trying to think of okay if this is its tail but it lives in canyons and rocky, mountainous regions. Well, it needs something to balance, and usually a tail does that. Oh, but if yeah. the tail is curled up, it can't, it's not going to help it balance. Yeah, it's not going to um, be of any help at, at that point. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of how, yeah, another yeah. way to incorporate that but still allow the creature to be a little more feasible. Yeah, no, and that's fair. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in. I want to look at this. Um, oh, yeah, the diagram. The diagram we have, yeah. So... What we're talking about here is taking different things we know, we can know about creatures in the world, and we're going to write some of them down, and then we're going to start moving them around and see what creatures come out. Like, basically, we're going to, we're going to make a classification and then try to fit creatures to it and go, oh, this would be a kangaroo, this would be something else. Yeah. And we found this really one of the many ways they, they, um, they do this, they classify this. This is one, one way. And it's split down the uh, horizontally and vertically. And if you look, there's a, so much going on here. There's a lot of data on this little little thing. It's taken, like, the more you look at it, the more interesting it gets. But if you look on the left side of it, the, the green part over here, and I think you can see my mouse. Um, let me make sure you can see my mouse. I see it. Oh, okay, capture cursor. I, I turned something off. And, okay, but yeah, so this side is the plant. So you see herbivores live over here. So this uh, left hemisphere is plants, and the right is animal. And then the, oh no, I used yeah. that wrong. And then the north here, the, the top side, is all um, things that eat live stuff. And in the bottom, things that decompose stuff. Right? I think that's it. Yeah. Yes. The idea is the, that you have the herbivores and carnivores. And these are, this is sort of the way an ecosystem works. Where things decompose, like um, smaller bugs uh, eat 
you know, flesh or whatever and turn it into other material. Like, they break stuff down, they decompose stuff. I think it's good to then, uh, to address the gatherer versus miner. Because oh, the okay. miners are decomposers. Um, so you're thinking, like, worms, um, carrion flies, things like that. Um, See, but that's not a miner. Right? Oh, A sorry, miner is yeah. something that doesn't move. Correct. So, and that's, that's a separate part where that's another example of even Shoot. more data on oh my the gosh. thing. Yeah. Sorry, but but you are right. Basically, the lower half are the decomposers. They make they take um, organic matter and break it down. And then on the top side, there are some animals eat herbs and some eat um, other meat. Yes. Um, the other thing is if we look, did I not get? Oh man, okay. So we sort of have these entrophic levels where you can see that there are plants, and then insects eat plants, and small herbivorous animals, mammals eat plants. Then those get eaten by these things, and those get eaten by these things. It's a food chain. Yes. Right? Because then the dead body of the thing that got eaten gets decomposed by the decomposers, whatever. Yes. Okay. This is not biology class, uh, but thank you if you were following along. I say all that because what we see here is we have a lot of ways to classify and to talk about what a creature is. And where they belong in your world. And where they belong in your world, yeah. So we have, I've written down some of these things. We have the food chain location. Um, there are producers and consumers. So a producer is a plant. A consumer yep. is something that eats something. Um, or and a then primary consumer might be something that eats that plant. Well, yes, uh, that's the thing. Primary consumers eat plants, and yep. then each consumer above them eats them below, and that creates a food chain. So, yep. yeah, primary consumers eat the primary producers, that whatever. Basically, this is a, a bug that eats the plants, and then this is the bird that eats the bug that eats the plant. Yeah, it's a yeah. Chain. But by deciding that, if we decide this before we decide any other constraints about the creature... There are certain things that they have to be, right? If they are a primary consumer, they can't be a plant. I mean, that's uh, quite obvious. Uh, but they are most likely herbivorous. Yeah. They have to be, in fact. They would yeah. at least have to be herbivorous herbivorous or omnivorous. Unless we make some really crazy primary producer that you haven't seen before. Exactly. Unless they were in... Um, the, everything I'm saying as far as like whether it's true or not is in our world. And mm -hmm. so what we get to do is we get to break some of these... Um, and decide what that means to, to use them. So I'm on the Google Doc here. You can see some of the ones, uh, things we've listed. Yeah, like even um, caustic waters is something that while there are... Oh, man. I don't think it's the Black Sea. <laughs> but out in the Middle East, like there are... Maybe not the Middle East. Oh, my God. Regardless of place. Anyways, there are waters that are crazy salty um, that like only flies can live in but because this is our world we can push that more so let's find these yes. caustic waters yeah. there's also um layers in the ocean if you go really far down you can find um more uh higher concentration of salinated water basically and there's certain eels that will dive down into it uh and then have to come out and they risk getting poisoned basically by it uh, because it's so bad. Oh, yeah. Like, they have to go into a caustic environment yeah. in order to... Do they hunt there or do they... Yeah. Like, what are they... That's what they go yes. in there for, for food? Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. So, I think it would be really cool to play with caustic waters, getting to turn up that knob and make a creature that's more around that. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, what is in that deep, briny water? <laughs> exactly. So, Josh says, um, if there is a creature that walks but grows food on his back slash skin, is that a plant that walks or an animal that's a producer? Well, here's or, what's really interesting. Well, okay, go ahead. That's the thing. I don't think it's either or. Uh, yeah. I was going to say it's probably a symbiotic relationship of some kind. And that's what is interesting about it. The idea is that if we... The reason you came up with that idea is because we started listing what things there can be, right? We've said, well, it can be this or this. And you said, well, what if it's both? What does that look like? It's a, a perfect example because I don't think it's either. But if it becomes a creature in our world, we've succeeded. Because I already have one. But, but here's what's interesting. So there are two ways to do this. Yes. One way is it's an animal where something else grows on its back. Yes. The other way is there's an animal and it grows something that other animals eat, but it's organic matter. Okay. Right? It's not a tree on it. Now, I'm just saying one of those is unlikely and crazy and one of them <laughs> is more reasonable. I just wanted to throw out that there are even multiple ways to do that. Got it. But you can go ahead if you want. What, what You said you had one or you had an idea. I about. have something similar to it, but then once I continue to register, you know, go through that thought, I realize that it's still a little bit different. Um, it was a porcupine kind of idea where the quills are hollow and um, basically little corals or um, bacteria that contain chlorophyll, you mm -hmm. know, little animals 
live in those quills and harvest the sun as the oh, little okay. creature goes about its day. Like live um, among the quills? They live in Literally the Literally inside the quills. Inside okay, the that's quills. That's what I thought you meant. Um, but it would provide further protection for the quilled animal as well. And there's a whole lot more behind oh. that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I get you, I get you. Um, but okay, so what we can do though is we have some creatures. Mm -hmm. And what I think I want to do is I want to take some of the creatures we have and add some of these uh, constraints to them and like start start making some okay. basically um, using some of the ones we have so you can see my doc screen oh it's really behind though right it is a little um, behind so but we have a few different things we have food chain location environment um, diet so we're gonna create a little uh, creature um, template here okay uh, and we're just going to fill in only these maybe add a few and then we're going to talk about what it would have to be in order for uh, that to make sense. Or maybe we'll even do one that exists. Sort of we'll stat out our own um, uh, our own. So so in in sort of the imagine it better system, this type of thing you're seeing me do here, what I just made is um, what I've called an identity. The thing is really it's just a list of things that mean something about a thing. And it's very vague for a reason. Hey. Um, it's just a list of <laughs> spaces basically to fill it and and if you notice down here we have a bunch of things that can fill those spaces um and that are that are split in various different ways and by filling these spaces we are going to see what happens so um we're, we're gonna say the animal first and then fill it in okay and then we'll do it the other way we'll do that a few times and then we'll maybe we'll do it the other way. all right hopefully this makes sense but i think seeing it you guys will totally get it so um what animal do we want to do do we want to do some sort of bird just a blue jay it doesn't matter yeah right so like what bird would you know all of these things about i guess you know what yeah let's do a bird we could do a bird we'll, we'll just do bird. a bird a blue jay right yeah so food chain location of a blue jay now we may not know this on everything but a blue jay i think is a primary consumer because they eat yeah. seeds and other plants and stuff yeah they eat uh seeds and then other primary consumers. So this is a blue jay, right? So yeah. primary consumer, which means they are low on the food chain. Yeah. Um, I guess I can put low. Uh, environment, uh, for this we had terrestrial, marine, or hybrid. So this would be terrestrial above ground. So arboreal? Terrestrial arboreal? Oh, actually, arboreal, because they live in the trees. Of course, they're birds. They mostly, well, blue jays, I keep saying they're birds, but we have a specific one. Blue jays live... The terrestrial arboreal, which means in the trees. Yes, Cassie, thank you. Um, that's what that was for. Uh, diet. Um, they are an herbivore, right? They're an insectivore. An insectivore. Oh, there's another one we don't even have here. What does that mean? I suppose you call I... blue jay an omnivore as well. Insectivore, eating insects, eating bugs. But that's the thing. I, I want, it makes me wonder, is it, does that mean only? That's the point is it means only because herbivore means only herbs and, uh, you know, only plants. Plant material. So it's yeah. like that means only insects. So, yeah, I think some, I guess it would be both, but insectivore belongs on the list. Doesn't matter. Um, eats only insects. I bet there's an, I bet there's you another word. You can see word. if they are. An, okay, that's fair. So Kathy's going to look another word, but that's what's important. By finding the boundaries of what we know about birds in real life, we will know what needs to be on this list. And then we could more easily create them because we found some, right? Yeah. So we don't know that one, right? Okay, we're going to skip diet for now. You can continue looking that up. Uh, primary biome. We haven't really listed biomes, but I'm going to say temperate... What do you consider us? Temperate marshland, I guess, right? <laughs> say marshland. Marshland. Say marshland. Um, um, so blue jays are largely vegetarian, but they are known to eat eggs and nestlings. Um, exactly. So yeah. Generally, and then bugs, grasshoppers, beetles, and stuff. So yeah, generally herbivorous. I don't know how to spell this actually. Herbivores. Wow, I did it okay. Hey, Cole. Generally herbivorous. What? Cole's here. Oh, Cole, hello. Um, we're brainstorming. Some, well, we're gonna get to brainstorming soon. We're we're working on our method first, and then we're gonna brainstorm. Yep. Um, but generally herbivorous, but will eat meat. Yep. Um, opportunistic. Will... Okay. Yeah, they'll get uh, protein when they can. Here's the other cool thing about an identity. Here, if we look at this. I can put whatever I want here, right? This just says primary, oh, primary consumer. It doesn't say low next to it. I, low on food chain, I guess I should say. The important thing I want to say is this isn't like rules where you have to put exactly what is in your roll table in your thing. Oh, hold on. You can make, yeah, what? I want to say they might actually be a secondary consumer. I think they are. That's okay. I, 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 
I'm sorry, I interrupted. Just because I was trying to make a point about the fact that it doesn't matter what we put, I can just change it to secondary and fulfill your constraint. But they're still low on the food chain. Okay. The important thing is, that's what the beauty is. Even if you said, I think they're a secondary slash primary, uh, that's not a thing. But what's important is these tell you what you can do, but not the only things you can do. If, you, if something else goes there, that's okay. And we'll see why later. But the important thing is, as long as most of them are structured, you get to change one or two to anything, and I think it'll do cool things. Uh, so temperate marshland, the group they're in. I said group to mean vertebrate, and then we, we have abstracted slightly so far some of the phylum kingdom class systems. Yeah. Thing. What we've done is vertebrates, invertebrates, and then classes. So this would be a bird. Yes. Um, under under our classes, which would, I'm not going to write it all, but it would fit under vertebrates, ma um, birds, whatever. Uh, but it has to be a bird. That means certain things, right? Yeah. In fact, I could even put avian. I like that better as a thing to call it. But it means that, it means a lot of things. Like, right. uh, it can only be a bird, so. Uh, hey, Tim. Oh, Tim's Welcome. here. Awesome. What's up? Yeah. Humans are primarily not cattle. Yeah, primarily. Thank goodness. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's what's interesting because we'll see. Yeah. We ha we have a lot to say about cannibalism. Um, so, uh, yeah. That, it'll be interesting to get that into that. That was a previous chat. Previous chat, yeah. Yep. Um, and then, okay, locomotion. This is one of my favorite ones because this required research from me. Cassie had an idea of this, but I had to research this concept. We're deciding how something walks. I've called that locomotion. It's a little bit of a misnomer, we're, we're, but the important thing is there's plantigrade locomotion, which places their full length of the foot on the ground, like bears and humans, yep. so the whole thing. Um, digitigrade, which walk with the length of their digits, but not the sole of their foot, Thank so you dogs cat. and cats. Yep, cat and dog. Um, and it, the way Cassie does, you have your hand on the ground and then your hand up, right? That's digitigrade. And then undulagrade, they walk on their tiptoes, often on hooves, yes. and so that's many other animals. Again, by deciding that about something, just how much it places its foot on the ground, you can say a lot. Now, um, technically, I think these Ooh, would be yeah. plantigrade. They place their whole foot. It's different, but we're kind of applying things that don't apply on purpose, right? So we're going to make them plantigrade in this case. Yes. Well, that's it. Well, are, of, of those options, do we need another one to describe blue jays? I would consider that... I'll, I'll look it up, but I would consider that digitigrade. Did oh, okay. No, that's good. No, no, that's fair. That I, I thought it was obvious which one it was, but I was wrong. Um, yeah. Best quote of the chat. You can call it a day now. Thank you, Cole. Yeah. yeah. Most no. yeah, go ahead. Most birds are classified as digitigrade animals. I, I didn't, re didn't realize that. I, I just assumed I knew which one. Okay. And then special oh. editions. What makes a blue jay a blue jay when you're describing it? Not necessarily like even biologically. Um, the color. It's blue, right? <laughs> uh, the males are blue. They're both, they're all blue. Oh, they're all blue. Okay. I, I'm so used now to male and female colors being different learning about birds that I just assumed blue jays would be. A lot of assumptions. It well. depends. It all depends. It all depends. But so, uh, blue jays are blue. Um, blue in color with specific markings. Yep. Uh, um, and they have that awesome little crest. And they have a crest. So that they're, so they're blue in color. I'm actually going to do this. So the other thing we're doing are what? Yeah. I'm just catching up with the chat. That quote. Oh that's yeah, yeah. It's a J and it's blue. Mm -hmm. um, exactly right, Cole. Mm -hmm. that, that's that's what makes it special. Our blue and color with specific markings has a. I want to use a word here, but it has a crest. But like has a. Um, it's um, kind of famous for the crest. And it sometimes likes to mimic the calls of hawks. Okay. Because we've actually heard that in our backyard. I thought it was a hawk. I Instead, saw. I saw a blue jay, and I was like, oh my gosh. So here's what's cool, right? So we have, I didn't do this, but Blue Jay. Mimics calls. So, so yeah, that's cool. Yeah. So here's what's cool. So um, what I said was we were going to make, we, we made out of our, our current generator now, we made a creature that exists. Mm -hmm. right? um, we can do this with a few, right? Let, let's do a quick one because let's do Morning Dove. First of all, it's spelled M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, right? Yes. Did not know that. Cassie's been telling me, look at the Morning Doves, and I've been in my like, mind spelling it wrong every time. Good morning. <laughs> nope, not that bird. <laughs> Here's the thing. They're going to look extremely similar, and this is going to point something out to you. They're going to be secondary consumers, right? They're probably whatever the Blue Jays are. Probably. Maybe one yeah. level higher, but probably not, right? They're, they're going to fit in the same food chain location. I think they're location. even more strict as far as being vegetarian. Like, I haven't seen a morning dove eat a bug. <laughs> oh, see, and that's fair. And, and what's important is, yeah, some of it but, is like, we, with the import, uh, yes, perfect information is not as important, but I get that's caught, fair. I always get caught in the details. I can, too, with things that I know a lot about, so I see what you mean. To me, I'm like, no, it's simple. Don't worry about it. And you're like, but wait, I get that. 
But they're probably also arboreal. I say probably. They are arboreal. I forgot we're describing something like this. I like what Cole said. Oh, and they are cranky fucks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yep. They really tell things up. They really do. Um, yeah. Uh, let's cool it with a hard F, but <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I just we'll, we'll try not to make it a habit. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, it's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. Just I was quoting. Rather say it than not say it. That yeah. is a good excuse when you're a kid. Um, <laughs> so, but same. Generally herbivorous, but herbivorous, but will eat meat. Primary biome, temperate marshland, because they live here. They're avian. They're digitigrade. But now we've hit stuff that doesn't count, right? These are not real. What are things that make a morning dove a morning dove? The sound they make when they fly away. Yeah, the whistling wings. Whistling wings. Uh, Kathy, tell us about whistling wings. Oh, yeah. So uh, the tips of their feathers, some specialized feathers on their wings, um, the tips of them are flexible enough to vibrate at the perfect little frequency to make an awesome little whistle. Um, Because I didn't know. I always thought that they made that sound from their mouth. Um... But in fact, it is their wings. What's interesting is... And it's an is, alarm call. The pitch changes. Exactly. What I want to say is I think people that have heard birds flying away and hear a whistling sound... Now, this may not be as uh, universal as I think, but I also thought that birds made sounds with their mouths when they flew away. Yeah. But what's happening is they're literally flapping their wings, getting away, escaping, and alarming at the same time. It Natural selection allowed the ones with the whistling wings to live more... Because yeah. it also helped an alert, right? Yes. I just want to point that out. But if you look, we have two very, very, very similar things here. Yeah. That's the beauty. Now, if we were to make our own, if we wanted to make a bird in our world, right. really, the funny thing is all we have to do is cool bird in world. <laughs> oh, brid. Brid? Uh, yeah, I typed brid on accident. Really, what Maybe we're doing... Maybe that's what it's called. It's, brid. it's a brid. Oh my gosh, it's a brid. Uh, cool brid. It's funny, it's a little on the nose, but for now we're doing brid. Brid. Oh, maybe it'll be spelled funny. Boom, Brid, we did it. Uh, really, all we're doing, uh, chat, I know you're behind a little bit, but give me cool um, things that could be about this bird. But the idea is all we have to do is write what's cool about them. What, yeah. What's cool about this bird? Let Name things that, that creatures have, not usually birds, that are like those I, things about them. So I would still like a whistling wing. Okay, yeah. Well, okay, yeah, <laughs> whistling wings. But this is good. This is good. Because there's not, I haven't, Besides morning doves, I haven't heard it anywhere else. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. and that's good. It's it's not the best for the example, but that is me projecting. It's okay. actually a perfect example to use whistling wings. Like, so yeah, absolutely it'll have whistling wings. It's carnivorous. I like that. Okay. Um, so we'll change that. And then whiskers. Okay, cool. Carnivorous whiskers. Perfect. This is going to be very interesting. So first, we're going to change the diet. Okay. All right. Tell me about carnivorous birds. Um, oh gosh. Okay, what so carnivorous of, birds do you know of? Let's a say lot that. of them are scavengers. We'll start really high. What? Which ones? Um, like name three? Name so, a couple? So they're hunter and scavengers, osprey, eagle, and then I'm going to toss in a vulture. So bigger birds, right? Ooh, lammergeier. That's my favorite. A lammergeier? Lammergeier. Lammergeier. Oh, you know what? I, a bearded I vulture. It. There we go. Bearded vulture. Same thing. I forgot I set this all up so that we could... Uh, we could uh, Google stuff while Cassie was saying it. A bearded detri- vulture. Pig oh, pug. A detrimentally soft beak. Oh. Okay, so that's hard, right? We're we're gonna we're gonna start. We're we're gonna hold that one. Okay. We're gonna put a pin in that. Um, I, we could still play with it. No, we can, but we have a few others. Like they're okay. just uh, we we just have a lot. Oh, right. gee, oh man, yeah. I was not about to try to type that into Google while people were watching Lammergeier, but I see it now. Um, but okay, here's the thing. This is a bird in our world. The only thing that's well, there's nothing different from this bird yet. Uh, but a morning dove. But I like car- carnivorous. Yep. So simply by changing carnivorous, simply by changing this. Ooh, I did it wrong. Vorous. Oh my gosh. My bad. Oh, V-O-R. Should have known. Um, simply by changing this, we changed so much about it, right? This used to be a morning dove. Now it's more like an eagle. It's more like a vulture. Yeah. We changed one thing. It has to be higher on the food chain because it has to eat meat below it. And the other ones being primary consumers, if you guys were here earlier, they eat plants. Yes. Because we changed that constraint, it changes other things. And even though we changed one value, in our context, a lot has changed. So we have a brid. Yeah. It's carnivorous, which means it's bigger. Still arboreal. It's no longer a secondary consumer. We're going to call it a tertiary consumer. Yeah. Um, in fact, we have an eagle at the top of one of these images. We could say this it's one, eagle, like... eagle, tertiary consumer. Maybe it could be considered apex, maybe depending on how crazy this goes. We'll That's see. true, actually. So we're going to leave this empty. Sorry. Forgot that um, 
ice in my mouth while I'm talking is a bad idea. So we're going to leave that empty because we're not sure yet. Yeah. And that will matter. Because we don't know how big it is yet. We haven't decided. Okay, we got a few others. Whiskers. Now here's where it's fun. When, when, when Cole said whiskers, Cole said whiskers, what I imagined was cat whiskers. So on their face, specific, but birds don't really have types of whiskers like that. They, they're not called whiskers, but they do have specialized feathers or barbs that do the same thing. Let okay. them know, like, um, fly catchers will have bristles, um, like around the nose area on top of their beak, so that way they know, okay, the insect's there, I'm going to go get it from that side. What was the bird? What's it called? A uh, fly catcher. Fly catcher bird. Yeah. But I realize I can pull it up, and I want to show you guys. Oh, they're tiny. I'm sure that one, ha maybe it has bar barbs. Burbs. Oh, that's okay, because I can also look up bird with barbs, because... That's what's interesting about this. Okay, so yeah, this bird has, this image of this bird has bristles. See, we get oh, a guys, close up of that on, face. I know, I'm like, we're, we're going on a, a, a hunt for, uh, yeah. Okay, here, bristles, and that's what it does. It's like our eyelashes in a sense, right? Yeah. Which are very similar to whiskers. So what we've done here is in a sense, I've backed way up. And you, while you said whiskers, they're really bristles or barbs that are just like whiskers. We made it fit. Yeah. Even though it shouldn't necessarily. Um, so I think it, so it would be, it's going to have whiskers. I think that's pretty cool. So that means that this could be something that preys on something else that flies in the sky. Okay. Because maybe it has to, so like a shark, maybe it has to close its eyes a little bit when it comes in for the kill. So those whiskers allow it to then, uh, you know, help target the item, the thing. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, okay, so I love that. We, we had more. Oh, a really long tail. I like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the other cool thing is, and I say cool, but like when we're listing the ones on Morning Dove, we could think of more, but that doesn't help us because right. we don't care what a Morning Dove has. We can have a ton of special editions here. Whistling wings, whiskers. What was the one? The really long tail. What I'm going to say instead yeah. is a split tail like a kite. Oh, yeah. Right? Split tail like kite. A kite is a type of bird, Cassie and I see, and we, we remarked uh, yeah, yesterday or the other day when they were flying. They have a tail that kind of comes out in a V. Yes. And you can see them steering with it because of how, how specific it is. And it's so cool. Um, uh, Cole says, Auklets, I'm pretty sure that's how you say it, have whiskers. Yeah, I think you said it great. Um, and okay. Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm Pig Pug. We're going to get to Detrimentally Soft Beak because Cassie was excited. Bones that protrude. Here's what's interesting is we're it, kind of cheating, but by making them real, what we can do is bones that protrude. What's interesting is when Cassie learned about feathers, they're made of keratin. Yes. It's not bone, but it's like, if you think about it, the it's, keratin can, it, it, one of the cool things about it is it can like form any form. It's so tough. Like there's, uh, you know, the endangered pangolins, they're covered in scales, but those are actually made out of keratin. So, uh, or a rhino's horn is also made out of keratin. So. Yeah, like a lot of things, but what's interesting yeah. is- it's so versatile. The way keratin grows is like, sometimes like a, a 3D printer. It's, the way feathers grow sometimes, oh, it's yeah. just, it can be anything that the creature can create in a sense. So consider that protruding bone is what Tim said, but really what I would do is it would look to people like protruding bone. Ooh, it but it would be, it would have keratin deposits that were hard or whatever, right? We would come up with what that is. Go ahead. Yeah. So in, if you can pull up like a feather anatomy, there's oh, yeah. the something called like a rhychus. Um, that's the main spine of the feather. So what if we had maybe a giant one of those? And that could oh, look like some crazy shaft. horns. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool, yeah. This is Google. You guys probably can't read it, but the rhychus is the big middle thing. The veins are the, you know, each of the little the, ones. Yeah. But well, so you're saying basically out. without the veins, so looking less like a regular feather and more like keratin horns coming out of the side or the top of its head. Yeah, take those whiskers and then turn that knob up. Oh, okay, basically. cool. Yeah, Tim says, cool, bone feathers. Exactly, where it's like now, yeah. Oh, maybe that's a thing. So it has small barbs over the top of its beak, but then as they go back, they get bigger and thicker. And oh, then form a crest. Because what, crown. what is the the bearded vulture? I like the way this looks. So I'm imagining the head of the bearded vulture in a way, but more of the keratin here and come. You know what I mean? Like bearded vulture, we happen to look at, so it was cool. Specifically, they're, this kind of. Puppy. They're so cool. I yeah. I really like them. Um, but Tim said, okay, there's more stuff in the chat. Um, uh, Cole says, chickens are omnivorous. Uh, uh, that's actually really interesting, but I guess it makes sense. They'll eat each other, I think, given the chance. Um, <laughs> Tim says, I'm such a grim dark. Uh, yeah, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, just laughing. Going. Okay. Um, 
But uh, I might call it that if I were from Dragon Grin. Is what the boom said. Oh, but this is it. I also don't know how large um, large you're imagining this bird maybe, but if it was pretty chunky and larger than average, that could also be kind of neat. So what's interesting, Tim, is it would have to be uh, larger, and that's the cool part. Go ahead, Jack. Um, and relating to its size, we need to consider... I like doing this. We need to consider what it eats because I showed James a couple pictures. Predators are oftentimes a little bit smaller than their biggest prey animal. Oh, yeah. Um, because there's only so many calories, you know, they can get from meat. There is a limit to the size. Okay. To some so extent. Let's 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 take what Tim said and we're yeah. going to say, okay, we need to decide the size of it. How we decide the size. We don't have on our list just yet. We yeah. only have the food chain location. Um, what's interesting though is what you've landed on is we have to figure out something else about the world. That's a good thing. You have to find out what, who does it interact with? And, and rather what we're in this book, my plan would be to have a section apart as a part of this animal that says kind of what you need for it to exist. Yeah. What would it need to be a large bird? It would need a prey that was at least as large as it were a little bigger. Yeah. That was English. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like a stoat can kill a rabbit, but a stoat is tiny. Yeah, uh, exactly. Like it can kill something much yeah, bigger. Yeah, a lioness can kill or can kill a zebra on its own, but it can't. It like a water buffalo is ginormous. You and, know. And more importantly, let me say this. Yeah. It will stop existing if its primary food source goes away, or it will have a much harder time, or it will simply get a lot smaller. It will take a long time. Yeah. But the idea is what I want to point out is that if it doesn't have this thing we're talking about, it can't be as big and it can't exist the same. Right. Um. Oh, omnivorous doesn't necessarily mean cannibal. I meant bugs. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yes. Um, I think we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, aren't things that can access the bone marrow larger than other predators? I don't know what that means. Um, um, like maybe use their bone marrow for stuff? So correct me if I'm wrong, Josh. I'm thinking like a hyena is big enough to get into the bones of antelope, zebra, water oh, buffalo, but I they're see. still s small. Smallish. Yes, exactly. Um, so or small. even a jaguar compared to alligators and crocodiles, but they prey on crocodiles in the Amazon. Yeah. I just saw like one of their faces today. So much muscle. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Um, okay, but yeah. what what's really interesting? That is very cool. Um, but what what's really interesting is so Tim he says they eat dog sized creatures and small people. Maybe that's what's interesting. Absolutely. It's more maybe that's, if you put this in your world. They have to eat something unless we're figuring out what they are eating. That's fair. Like, it's, it's, if they're in a desert and you have this, you go, well, that doesn't make sense. What does it eat every day? There's a bug flying like right around. I know. No, for me, for me. I'm just like, if anybody sees me doing this a lot, that's why. Yeah, I saw it too, and I was like, I'm not going to swat at it right now. But what that means is food chain location is higher. Again, as we talked about, it doesn't actually fit what I've written here. These are more complicated things. But we just, we just need to know that broadly it's higher on the list. It's carnivorous. Is it still arboreal? Still lives in the trees, right? Mm. Like, where do eagles live? They nest on mountains yeah. that probably not arboreal? Pro oh, trees when they can get them. But, like, if you live in cliffs and mountains, I would also say look also, at those right, crevices. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. The, the, um, oh, just want to squeeze their little jaguar face. <laughs> cool stuff. I don't know if anyone saw that, but I absolutely just poked myself in the eye with my glasses. No, well, they, they're definitely going to uh, um, scroll look back for it now, now and see, yeah. So something I wanted to point out was that Cassie, look, let's talk about a brid, right? Now we've created something here. Let's talk about a brid. Yeah, what is a brid? And remember the detrimentally soft beak. Yes, we're going to, okay. we're going to. I want us to just make sure we come back to that. That's good. Do you have anything on that? Do you have any, do you know where you'd start? Not yet. Just yes or no, do you know where you'd go? For that. For that. For detrimentally soft, detrimentally soft beak. I was thinking that. No, okay. no, no. Yes or no? You you have something, right? I just wanted to... Yeah. Okay, that's all. I was just curious. I want to talk about a brid real quick, and then okay. we'll add that last thing. Awesome. I just wanted to... Because we are doing the method a little bit, too. We're chatting. But, all right. Uh, what I wanted was see to you. compare this to... Is somebody leaving? Yeah. Bye, Tim. Oh, yeah. See you, Tim. Thanks for jumping in. Um, Josh says, uh, host eagles, I think that's what he means, uh, could take a kid. That's one of those nursery rhymes in your world. I do... That's one of the important things. Okay, so... That's the point of this book, right? Yeah. Is, is if, imagine you got a book that allowed you to make creatures in this fashion. Um, what's interesting is we've only done birds thus far, and I think it's been pretty cool, but we now have a carnivorous, uh, more predatory bird, but we started with a morning dove, right? It ha has whistling wings. Now that it's predatory, 
the whistling wings aren't necessarily for alert, but maybe they're for something else. Yeah. That... Right? We haven't had to do any work. We just went, well, are all these things still true? It is still avian. It could still live in a marshland. We could list all the places it could live. But you see what I mean where I'm like, now that we've done whistling wings and carnivorous, by mashing them up, we are forced to find how it works. And I think that will allow us to create really cool things. Maybe the whistling wings is part of like um, a display. It's by Perfect. sound. Because exactly. it's through the mountains and canyons. All we know is that it probably something. isn't an alert because it is more of a predator, right? That's Correct. the that's a really cool thing. So I love that. But okay, let's talk about detrimentally soft beak. I'm gonna yeah. Um how would it catch stuff if its wings were whistling? Right. It, it's something that it can turn on and off, right? It's similar to a way a bird could flash or a, a you Ooh. know, it would be um and does it wait just wait until something dies nearby and then walks over and kicks it to death? I figured for the moment it still flies, so it wouldn't necessarily kick something to death. Um, it can, yes, so I was thinking the feathers whistle when it dives, but perhaps that stoop, which is, uh, what it's called when a falcon does a dive, maybe that's part of the, um, behavioral display. Yeah, Basically yeah. the stoop, you need to go as, you know, crazy as you can and then pull up. Like, maybe that's part of it. And potentially, exactly, um, maybe it would be a noise thing, a loudness thing. Yeah. But or in, maybe like a song. Yeah, go It can be a song. Yeah, we can play with it. But in this case... Um, when I'm thinking of this bird, that's, what is it called? Bird. Uh, Brit. Brit. It's called a Brit. It's a cool bird in world. It doesn't matter, yeah. Um, maybe it's something more like an eagle where it just pulls prey off the mountainside. Yeah, You yeah. know, and then lets it tumble, and then it'll go and get it. And then, and that's what's interesting. So then the whistling wings that people would hear, what's, what's cool is a lot of this will be from the perspective of people, because they're who are usually interacting with these things. Yeah. People will hear this whistling and not necessarily know what it is, but if it's not important for the birds to dive quietly, yeah. it would dive loudly, because the thing's already down there dead. Yes. So I like the idea of just making it a sound that people hear occasionally, or that, that picks up in the spring because that's when they mate, or like whatever, you know. But I'd... you get some tails in there like that. Yeah, and I think it would still like dive bomb to some extent, and if we heard the whistle that might just mean it's going too fast like it's not going to do a full stoop because let's say this thing is big enough that if it does actually crash into something it could really hurt itself yeah that's what's important is basically the the whistling wings have become a thing that they can do yeah when they're trying to attract a mate yeah but not necessarily something they could not control Oh, um, and maybe it's a territory display. Like, you hear the sound, that means there's one in the area. So they do that between themselves to oh, yeah. get a territory because they're predators and don't want competition. Exactly. So we've, we've created, yeah, whistling wings when dive bombing. What is it? You said it's a, st uh, a stoop? Stoop, yes. Um, whistles during a stoop. I don't know. Uh, what I want to point out, though, is we, we have this. It might fight other birds in the air, something you mentioned. Yeah. We have just a bird. Like, this potentially exists in our world this this could right we've none of these things are special uh, yeah. fantasy uh yet you know not necessarily not that they have to be not all of them have to be but now we're going to take this and we're gonna very slightly not like it has to be the focus of your campaign or your your adventure but that it can be something in the background and still be kind of real we still didn't get to address the beak we have the beak but consider that it could be something uh, um fantastical as well that's why I wanted to put it off. And then the other thing is the whistling wings. We can do a lot with that separate from the realism in real life. It could be song. So let's talk about the beak. And we could maybe, maybe the whistling, let's say whistling wings. It could be whistling feathers somewhere else. So maybe on the tail. Okay. So when it flares out. Oh, okay. Yeah. And it exits a stoop. Maybe that elicits like a sudden sound or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. A crash. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but, but that way no matter what, a, spe a specific sound, that's all we would say. Yeah. Because you would maybe decide what the sound is in your world. Yeah. You play with it. Yeah. Um, for the bill, I was actually going to take it back um, to, like, kind of dinosaur -y stuff. Because when I think of different kind of beaks, I also think of geese. And they do have rows of, like, teeth, like hard nodules oh, or something yeah. in, their, in their jaws. So I was wondering if it could have... A soft beak that's uh, like fleshy, like a reptile or something, but oh, then have yeah. those rows of serrated. Okay, similar to the other things, and I didn't, I didn't really consider this as much, but similar to the other things we talked about, 
detrimentally soft beak is what somebody put in the chat. But what you created is you you said, okay, well, if it was if his beak was that soft, it wouldn't use it like a normal beak of a bird. It couldn't. Yeah. So let's give it teeth because it would need something, right? This thing has to exist and is 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 surviving of the fittest. And you it know, needs, like it's doing something. It does need a way to dispatch its prey. It needs yeah. to be able to chow down. So consider that detrimental in this case is a descriptor of most birds, but in this case, it's not detrimental to the actual thing. It's just that it doesn't have the benefits of a beak, but it has teeth and it can attack. Yeah. And again, we've taken something and we've made it detrimentally soft beak. We've made it what I think is, is a lot more interesting. Yeah. Um, and again, okay, so what here, what if it whistled when it dove, uh, uh, like a dive bomber Josh said, I think we got said that one, but then pig pug, the frequency of the whistle is what determines the speed. It's when you stop hearing, you need to worry because it's in a top speed dive. I like that too. Like a kind of breaking the sound barrier yeah. thing where you hear it, hear it, hear it, and then don't hear it. That, that yeah. style. But that's, what's cool is you can have. It's but, hard to tell where it is. Yeah. Basically yeah. Basically because the it. sound travels at a different speed than the bird. What's interesting is we've come up with a lot of different things. And yeah. so consider that we're not just creating one. You're creating all these different things for your world. Um, and you can we're going back and forth and brainstorming. And we have a much better idea of what sort of things to say. Because we're kind of all on the same page in the same area. Because I think of, of partly this method we've set up. Yeah. Um, so did you want to take a creature that we've made and fill one of these out and see what it's like and talk about it? Hmm... I suppose so. Uh, we've got about 10 more minutes or 20 more minutes. Um, no, 10 more minutes. Sorry. That that will do. Um, unless, the, did you want to talk about more about this? Did you want to? I'm trying. I'm thinking. That's all right. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? We're going to finish up uh, yeah. here in a little bit. Um, 10 minutes. Um, I'll just keep talking about the Brid here uh, for a while. But uh, we should finish up the Brid. If there's anything else, we can think about it. Well, and that that's what I really want to point out is, oh, okay, yeah, we had... Hmm. Or we can try that kangaroo canyon thing with this. Okay, yeah. yeah. Canyon kangaroo. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to copy and paste this. Drop your questions if you have any in the chat. But we're just going to... I'm going to show you like how, how cash this is. Um, canyon kangaroo. Uh, are you ready? We're going we're gonna to do it big. Boom. Yeah. Okay. Where does a kangaroo fit on the food chain? Or do we want to do that? It's usually a primary consumer herbivore. Okay, primary. Okay, so that, boom. Yeah, all right. So we know that. Now, that doesn't mean this one has to, but I, I think we're going to fill this out and we can tweak. For the moment. It's terrestrial. It is no longer sometimes arboreal. Um, primary biome. Uh, what do you think? Bushland? <laughs> I only know that because of uh, Australia. Um, rocky, basically rocky outcrops, canyons. Oh, um, this one specifically requires canyons, so it's a little more. Yeah, it's yeah. very specialized to its location, let's say. Okay, yeah, and, that, and that's fair, because, uh, and that may not fit in primary biomes, but hey, this is an exercise, right? Group. It's no longer avian. Uh, kangaroos are famously mammalian. Marsupials. Marsupials, no. Oh, no, I'm thinking. I think marsupials fall under mammals, so. No, yeah, yeah, that's fair. I was thinking that there's something, what is it, duck platypus that is like, there's one that like, a does, one. shouldn't be, but is. I was thinking that, but it's you're not right. not an echinoderm. Um, so we didn't actually, we don't have marsupial down there, but you guys get it by this point. All right, what's their locomotion style? Um... Mm. Plantar. Uh, plantigrade uh, places full length of foot. Are nah. kangaroos plant plantigrade? We just look it up. That's the answer, guys. The leg of a plantigrade mammal. No. Oh yeah. Other plantigrade species include raccoons. Blah blah blah. Kangaroos. Hey, yep. there we go. So they're plantigrade now. Again, we're just putting what's here. But I I had to look that up, guys. I I learned what plantigrade was today, and we looked that up and, and are able to create a creature. All right, special edition. So what what is the it, that this thing has it you this is the one that has the um what is it exoskeleton uh keratin uh folding jumping thing appendage appendage uh you gotta spell that right exoskeleton keratin there we go um notes uses its jumping tail i'm gonna call it a jumping tail to uh, escape predators. Yes. I'm, I'm trying yeah, to visualize no, you're good, you're good. it, so that's yeah. why I'm spacing. <laughs> um, oh, okay, so Josh says maybe it uses it uh, when it's fighting, not hunting. Uh, the the, um, the bird. The bird, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, we yeah, people asked reasonably about that bird. Uh, we switched gears so fast, but, but we that did. was totally reasonable. But that's okay. Uh, but I like that, Josh, because it... I like that it's not about hunting, but it's in other social circumstances. Yeah. Um, another cool thing is, especially with a... 
another cool thing you can do with this method is you can add other things, right? These are ones we started with. Right. Food chain location, whatever, whatever. We can add other stuff. We can do... Um, uh, um, you could more specifically say biome, I suppose, instead of location. Well, yeah, that's fair. What I mean is I want to add that they're highly social. I don't even know what the thing would be called. Thing that oh, yeah, highly social? Socialism. For the bread? Yeah. That's what's interesting. I'm not saying they have to be. What okay. I'm showing you is that I can, after we make something and it's okay, it's almost there, you just add another one, right? You take the generator you've made and you add a brand new thing to generate for. Got it. You go, all right, what are its feet like? I don't know. That's a bad example. But the concept that we are or, or not very social, that would be fine too. But what's important oh. is we've added a new thing that we haven't considered yet and threw I, something in there. Yeah. I got a cool idea. So they're social hunters. Um, I was thinking with their whistling wings, what if they intentionally try to herd things in the valleys below or what have you using those whistles? They work oh, okay. together to herd them using sound. I like that. Maybe onto tough cliffs or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uses uh, sound trickery, I'm going to say. Um, the shortest, coolest yeah. way I could make up to, to describe <laughs> yeah. it. Uses sound trickery to herd animals. Herd prey into... Prey. Uh, to edges and precarious places. Yeah. To hunt yes. them. Because yeah. then it pulls them off, drops them in. Advantageous the locations to better yeah. succeed. <laughs> um, exactly. And so... Grady had a... Yeah, Grady says, what about developing a new group such class as classification similar to reptile that has adapted to live births while being cold-blooded? A new variable. Uh, oh, sorry. Cole, I think, was saying a new variable to, to what I added, and that is yeah. absolutely what it was. A new variable. That's what you'd say in program. And for Grady, we're kind of... I've been playing with that because we talked also about, like, what would an avian rocti uh, rocktillian, crocodilian look like? And, yeah. and that's a really exactly what we've done is you've seen us you've seen the generator right here's the generator we have kind of like rough just notes of what things can be that's all we've done is we went what locomotions can it have what uh, things can it have right but exactly so we we've used what exists in our world but the next step would be one of the next steps would absolutely Grady be saying okay let's make one up let's let's take one of these and instead of freshwater seawater or caustic it lives in acid. You know, like just d directly acidic things. Yeah. So now it has to have this hard armor or it has to be has not to... react or it has to do something. It means, it shows you a lot about it. You will get very far by, again, taking this whole template and just changing one of those things. Biome lives in a vacuum. Oh, shoot. Suddenly, this is a very different morning dove because you've taken something we... we I'm thinking compile. of a tardigrade with wings. <laughs> right? But you're thinking of something, and we've started somewhere. You're compiling things that can exist in our world, and then to make them fantastical occasionally, throwing a new one in or curveballing something or changing it. So absolutely, I love that idea. Like buffalo jumps. I don't know what jump, buffalo jumps. I don't. Maybe buffaloes jump. Uh, Cole is going to tell us. And um... I'm sure they do. Oh, oh, a buffalo jump is, is a cliff formation which Native Americans historically oh. used. I opened this in the wrong tab, guys. You don't get Got to see it. Got it, though. Got I, it. I realized, I forgot that the point was when people said stuff like that, I would look it up and we would all learn, and I missed it. A buffalo jump is a cliff in which uh, they used to hunt and kill bison in mass quantity. So the Native Americans would actually do that, and yeah. that is awesome. Because maybe the people in our world learn to do that by watching the brids. Yeah. They see that, that they trick them, and, and then it's easy to kill them on the cliff, and they start doing the same thing. Um... Yeah, see, Cole's way behind. Like, we learned it, and, and I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. It's the uh, lag. Yeah. It's, it's the, the lag. lag. I'm sorry. I, like I said, the point was when people say things like that, we would have to... Um, Head smashed in Buffalo Jump is a place in southern Alberta. I think that's the whole name Oh, of wow. It. Head smashed in Buffalo Jump, I suppose is how I would say it. I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, let's... Okay, so we did the Canyon Kangaroo, right? And you can see immediately how... By using terms that exist, yeah. we've created something. Um, what do you want to do for the next four minutes? The next four minutes? Do you want to make something? What do you guys think? Um, what, what do you think of this? Was this cool? I, this is like sort of... Let's talk about, now that people are here, yes. let's talk about why we're doing this. It's probably good. Yes. So my goal for this method is to... Yeah, that's the whole name of the place she says. My goal for this method is to... For Cassie and I to design an exercise in which we can create fairly easily creatures that can live in your world and then just like we did create a perfectly normal creature in our world a morning dove uh copy and paste it change some of the things change some of the values change some of the keys you know and then to start brainstorming about what that would have to be yeah then take that and then 
make that creature like um, write about it as though it were in the monster manual, say, where you write you know different things about it. Um, yeah, Josh says Canyon Kangaroo sounds Can- like a weird like a weird gang. Canyon Ruse. Canyon Ruse, yeah. Um, the other thing is this book would so it would the point would be to have that style of method, and then yeah. depending on where we land, there would be. Uh, diagrams and stuff similar to our world of those classifications that we had so you would be able to see like the kingdom and phylum and stuff and it would be fake for our world but an abstraction so you have it right you will suddenly be able to create a classification system for creatures in your world so that the players have a better idea instead of saying oh that is a rust monster it's like well what class is a rust monster Yeah, like what does that mean and you could classify those things but in this sense by starting at the top there you can create sort of regular creatures in your world for players to interact with, like a boar. But you understand more about it, but also you can create fantastical creatures in your world, but with the same level of realism as, as some of the others. So um, between basically the point is to make a method, use the method to make a bunch of cool ones, and then release both the method and all the monsters, and hopefully everybody gets to make and cool gonna creatures be awesome. for their world. And as far as monsters go, definitely check out my Instagram, because every once in a while I am tossing out, like random sketches that i have of these creatures to be you know that are works in progress so definitely check it out too um yeah and exactly absolutely follow cassie on on instagram um on tabletop terrors on patreon uh that's uh where you're going to see creature book stuff pop up before it comes officially to absolute tabletop so if you want sort of first look stuff it'll be there yeah and Um, we have to answer this question we do we do we do do. have to answer this question Um, for cole cole says and you'd also be able to see the food chain it can prompt you to create new animals exactly just by looking at all of those things you can it, you, it gives you a decision to make. It just leaves it to you to make it, and that's so much easier. Um, and then Cole says, yes, Cassie, if you want to answer her question. What is it? Um, what does the bread eat? What does the bread eat? Maybe it eats the canyon kangaroos. I still want to look into the bio more, but I do have this giant northern amphibian that um, is in, like, glacial ponds and stuff. Like, maybe it tries to get one of those if it can. Oh, um, okay, if it's a yeah. good opportunity. I think that's a sketch that I've been playing with as well. That one's on Instagram. Um, but I will try to find something for it to work with. Yeah, yeah. But I do like that idea. But again, that, that question of, okay, what does it eat? Because that thing is then in the area. Um, another concept I really like that comes with this is, like I said, having the perspective of the people that live in the world. So uh, it would, the, the book would have things in it like, what trade things could you get from these? You know, or... What extra things would be available for people to kill, things to kill, because of the, what this Brit is killing? You know? Yeah. Brits, uh, Brits eat, kids. eat kids. They probably it, yeah. do. They would. Yeah. They would. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think that is going to do it I uh, uh, for, for the stream. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is really cool. All right. It's children, Cole says. Yeah. Um, this is really cool. Very excited for the creature book. Uh, just a working title for now. But you can see how just making a, a creator allows you to get to brainstorming if you just spend a little time. I spent probably an hour uh, making this, just learning about birds. So, uh, yeah, awesome. Thanks, everybody. Uh, um, Stay warm and have a good night.